All right, uh, so first and foremost, uh, my name is Brad Antonowitz. Um, I'm part of Open Security Research, which is a project sponsored by Foundstone. Um, and so uh, I've done some wireless work in the past, and when Rob uh, started getting really interested in 4.9 gigahertz, uh, it, got, it got really attractive to me. Um, so, uh, well, Rob got extremely attractive. Not in that way, I sir. Mean, look at that. <laughs> look at that body. He works out. Anyway. <laughs> wiggle, 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 yeah. Uh, so I, I joined, uh, joined Rob, and, uh, and here we are presenting. So uh, I'm Rob Portfleet. I'm a wireless service line lead at Foundstone, and I uh, also contribute to the uh, Open Security Research blog. So uh, yeah, I, I kind of stumbled across the uh, 4.9 gigahertz uh, spectrum a while ago, and kind of pretty much these things like, like wonder what's out there. So that sort of spawned the whole thing. And then um, there's certain aspects that I could have used Brad's uh, expertise in. I asked him to uh, help me, and he graciously accepted. So here we go. Uh, so I guess the very first thing that we should mention um, is when we started looking at this, this is all F like uh, licensed FCC bands. Um, and so this was really kind of concerning for us. You know, there's definitely some laws around interacting with these bands. Uh, we tried to look some of it up. We looked in the Code of Federal Regulations and the Communications Act of 1934 and uh, all types of all these ridiculous statutes that all seem to be, you know, uh, kind of contradict each other back and forth. And it was kind of difficult for us to understand where the boundaries were. So before you look into any of this stuff, probably the best thing you should do is really proceed with caution. Um, you know, uh, we're masking all types of data that we found. Um, we're not, uh, you know, talking about any particularly damning information. Um, it's all kind of general war driving stuff that you'll see here. Um, and, you know, so just really be careful with this kind of stuff. Uh, you know, nobody likes uh, pat downs or, uh, you know, dropping freedom soap pats or, yeah, getting maced or anything like that. So just be careful, okay? Uh, so one thing I just wanted to add real quick is, you know, we didn't do any transmitting. Uh, it's definitely verboten to transmit in license bands, uh, if you, unless you have a license. Um, so there was no transmitting or interaction or cracking of anything that took place uh, with any of these networks. It was just a case of uh, passive monitoring uh, strictly. Uh, so a quick outline of our talk. So we'll talk a little bit about what the hell this public safety uh, thing is all about. Um, and we'll go into uh, kind of this different spectrum allocations for four popular public safety spectrum uh, uh, bands. And then we'll also uh, take a specific look at 4.9 gigahertz and, um, you know, how to find these type of networks, how to interact with them, and see what we found on, on uh, just three different networks. Uh, so first and foremost, I guess uh, we should talk a little bit about what the hell public safety is. Um, so there's always been a public safety spectrum out there. Uh, essentially, this public safety spectrum was mostly dedicated uh, for kind of voice communication, so police officers would have conversations back and forth and you know talk about the, how their wives suck and all this stuff. Um, and then uh, what ended up happening is after 9-11 and Katrina and all these other issues, uh, the 9-11 Commission found out that all like these first responders were having all these problems communicating because everybody's on different frequencies and nobody could hear each other and it was a, a problem. Um, so in the last uh, probably about 10 years or so, the FCC has been taking a special interest um, and trying to put you know extra effort into allocating bands for public safety. Um, and by public safety, I mean what's written on the bottom of the slide there. Uh, basically to protect the safety of life, health, or property. So uh, that's basically, you know, uh, everything, I guess. So to summarize, uh, basically the, the FCC's uh, and public safety's main concern with it was interoperability amongst the networks. So there's no real interoperability communication that could take place between different public safety agencies. So that was part of the, uh, the reason for this whole push. Uh, so the frequency uh, allocations that we'll look at, and again, they, these, um, the 800 megahertz spectrum has been around for a little bit. Uh, these other ones have kind of gotten a lot of appeal uh, in the last 10 years or so. So we'll look at the 700 megahertz spectrum, the 800 megahertz spectrum, special look um, at 4.9, and then we'll also talk about the 5.9 gigahertz spectrum. First up is 700 megahertz spectrum. Now this was, uh, this spectrum was actually reallocated after uh, the digital TV cutover. So you probably heard a lot about that. Uh, you had to help your grandmother uh, figure out what to do with uh, her TV uh, and all that good stuff. Um, what they did was they took two blocks uh, out, out of the spectrum in the 700 megahertz range um, and allocated them for this. And they split each block into two categories, broadband and narrowband. Um, and then there was a guard in between to kind of help protect the two. And we'll talk about each one of those real quick. 
Uh, so the 700 megahertz broadband, uh, this is an awesome picture. This is a, it's a unicorn peeing a rainbow. I think they could figure out but what there, that is, Brad. <laughs> sort of self-explanatory. There's no horn there. You might think that's just a very fancy horse, but in fact, it is a unicorn peeing there a rainbow. There is no horn. I, that's, what I'm, that's exactly what I'm saying, dog. I don't know. Uh, all right, so anyway, 700 megahertz broadband is basically the new hotness. Everyone is getting super excited about it. Municipalities are going crazy all over the place. Um, and they're super happy because it's this nationwide LTE network. Um, so they actually hired these telecommunications providers to build this whole thing out. Um, and it's going to all run LTE and blah, blah, blah. It's supposed to be great. It was initially supposed to be the, a backhaul only network. So you'd have kind of individual municipalities and uses like on the scene um, type of networks that would communicate using this backhaul network. Um, but then everyone, you know, uh, saw that LTE can do a whole shitload of stuff. Um, so they really kind of uh, are getting excited about it. Um, the important thing to mention about the broadband is it's only in a very infant deployment now. So there's actually one here in Vegas, and then there's also another one out in Denver. Um, but outside of that, it's really not been deployed uh, anywhere. Oh, so there's, there's been a handful of like, uh, like preliminary deployments of it. It's it really, like Brad said, it's pretty much not out there. It's still in its infancy. Um, but there was a couple like uh, preliminary deployments of it, and like the... Um, uh, the uh, FCC and the uh, National uh, Public Safety uh, Telecommunications Commission, but it's told these guys, well, hold on, uh, because we're trying to get this whole thing straightened out as to how we're going to deploy it. Um, and basically what it comes down to is it looks like they're like, just completely dragging their feet on this right now. And then in the narrow band side um, with 700 megahertz, that's all your nationwide P25 stuff. So if you've done um, uh, uh, any research uh, into P25, you'll know there's, there's been a kind of a good bunch of hacks coming out for them. People found out that there's some weaknesses in the decryption schemes that, or encryption schemes that are being used. Um, and some other, Travis uh, Goodspeed came up with a little um, IME um, uh, denial of service attack for them. Um, so there's definitely some stuff out there. It's used for state and local government. Uh, so you'll see like, um, you know, everybody from Parks and Recreation using it to uh, Secret Service and FBI. Um, again, all talking about their wives. I, I don't know how anybody gets anything done. Uh, for 800 megahertz instead, um, there's, uh, it's actually a whole reconfiguration. Um, so 800 megahertz has been around for quite some time. Uh, the weird thing about 800 megahertz is the way it was broken up, it, it kind of allowed for some interference. And so Nextel um, actually started building their network, uh, the whole Nextel network, in this band. And um, when the band, when their allocation got kind of a little low, what they did was started buying licenses from other people. And then they uh, basically bought all of these licenses up, started uh, transmitting at a higher power, and that was starting to interact with all of the public safety stuff. So the FCC got pissed about that, um, did this whole reconfiguration thing where they put public safety on one side and Nextel all the way on the other side of the spectrum um, and built out all of these guards and protection bands and all that stuff. This is all going to be another more P25 work. Uh, reconfiguration is kind of almost done um, and people are starting to use P25 on that area. So uh, what really exacerbated the problem uh, with Nextel uh, having all these transmitters was that um, public safety uses what's called a high, uh, traditionally uses what's called a uh, high site architecture where it's uh, a minimal amount of transmitters on uh, really high sites like think very tall buildings, hilltops, things of that nature uh, versus um, Nextel's uh, EMSMR SMR architecture, is, uh, what's known as like a low site architecture where it's on uh, like 30 to 50 foot monopoles, two to three story buildings, stuff like that and much more transmitters so it was really getting completely in the way of the uh, public safety spectrum all right and then 4.9 gigahertz uh, got a, a lot of uh, attention does anybody know what the background image is from <laughs> dr. obvious strikes again <laughs> Uh, all right, fair enough. I'll just leave that as there. If you know what it is, uh, let me know. It's really obscure. Anyway, uh, so the interesting thing about uh, 4.9 gigahertz was that um, a lot of municipalities, it gave first responders the ability to start communicating traffic at high speeds. Um, so that was really interesting, uh, especially when you think of accident on the scene network. So, you know, the, the police arrive, uh, they take a bunch of data about everything. As the ambulance arrives, they transmit that data and they can all kind of have this little network uh, amongst themselves and, and do all this stuff. 
Um, and so uh, this got a lot of attention by municipalities and local government. And what they ended up doing was going out and buying up or actually applying for all of these different licenses. Uh, and what we found was that actually not everybody who has a license um, even uses the stuff. I, it was almost like an arms race to a certain extent to, for everyone to get all of the 4.9 gigahertz amazingness. Um, it's kind of a general use spectrum, so that means they can use it for basically anything they want. It's been used for everything like um, the G20 summit to, uh, to emergency warning systems to, of course, they put SCADA on it. Uh, everyone puts SCADA on everything. Um, so, of course, SCADA exists on it too. Um, and it's basically been used for almost everything. Yeah, so they were pushing the user for a lot of different things. Traditionally, or, or originally, it was slated that they, you know, it was thought that they were going to use it for uh, on the scene response, like ad hoc networks between re first responders at a particular scene of an accident or uh, fire or whatever. Um, but it, what it seemed to uh, have gotten most use from is for point to point fixed links, like backhaul and uh, mesh type architectures for uh, uh, metropolitan area networks, uh, municipal wireless. Um, so yeah, it seemed that its actual purpose evolved over time. Yeah, so um, the FCC kind of breaks things down into two types of devices. They have high power and low power devices. Um, so low power devices, they don't really put too many regulations on it. It's uh, roughly anything uh, that transmits under 20 dBi um, and there's some changes based on channel widths and uh, ha how much stuff you're putting on there. Um, but the FCC doesn't basically pose really anything there. But for the high power devices, um, they've kind of put together this very loose channel plan. So there's basically 10 1 megahertz channels split in the middle by 8 5 megahertz channels. And you can kind of bond these however you want. So what you'll end up seeing a lot in, in the real world is different venues, ve uh, vendors have different channel widths and, and different different um, kind of uh, organization of this spectrum. And so it, it's, it gets to be kind of a pain in the butt when you're road driving or trying to figure out what's out there um, because all of these different channels are all different sizes and you have to make your card work with all of that different stuff. Um, there are some recommendations by um, the National Public Safety Telecommunications Commission, um, which is pronounced uh, NIPSTIC, which is kind of an odd uh, acronym name. Sounds uh, dirty. Yeah, it definitely sounds dirty. Uh, but at any rate, there are some recommendations and you can follow that if you wanted to, uh, but generally uh, vendors seem to do kind of whatever they want as long as it follows this, uh, this thing. So generally we'll talk about this in a little bit. Um, the best way to, uh, to look it up is pretty much look at the vendor documentation and uh, FCC uh, site search we'll talk about in a minute. Um, but basically they're, 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 even though there's recommendations, they're all over the map in terms of where the channel centers are. Um, but generally it's either going to have to be a 5, 10, or you can be 15 or 20, but I've never really seen 15 megahertz wide channels in use. So once you figure out what the channel centers are, uh, or the likely channel centers, then you can experiment with different channel widths, but it varies wildly uh, per vendor. Another really, uh, probably the most annoying thing the FCC did uh, was impose different uh, spectrum masks on, on the different bands. So um, the outermost spectrum mask is uh, what you use for low power devices, which means it's totally 802.11 compatible. You can use a standard 802.11 adapter to view it all um, and everything's fine. Um, but the inner more line up there is um, the, the spectrum mask that it puts in place for high power devices. Uh, and that's just enough to mess with everything that we're doing. Um, so, uh, you know, uh, there the idea was to prevent against kind of interference and stuff with high power devices, um, but it's just been a nuisance to hackers all over. Uh, yeah. So, um, you can thank Motorola and other uh, equipment vendors for this one. Uh, basically, they were pushing very hard early on when the spectrum was allocated to have uh, to use a strict mask that wouldn't be compatible with a 80211 uh, equipment. Uh, the public safety interests um, fought back hard against this because they wanted to be able to use pretty much commercial off-the-shelf equipment like 80211A equipment, maybe slightly modified to be able to do this um, to keep costs down. While the vendors wanted to be able to sell stuff at a high price you know, because, you know, the government's got the big bucks in their minds. Um, so the, that was pretty much a compromise was reached, and that low power devices would be 80211 compatible while these high power devices uh, wouldn't. So it was at least a partial uh, victory for the um, uh, public safety uh, advocates, or spectrum ad advocates, rather. Uh, the last kind of cool uh, public safety allocation was the 5.9 gigahertz intelligent transportation system uh, allocation. And so this is really kind of cool stuff. Um, it deals with 
Uh, it's all based on this 802.11p standard, um, and it deals with all of this stuff in the way that we travel. So uh, it, it can help um, do things like uh, accident avoidance for anybody who drive, uh, drives badly. Um, you know, it detects that you're about to almost hit someone, so it recorrects you and fixes everything. Um, it also does really cool things like, um, uh, you know, if they're, uh, uh, an emergency vehicle is approaching uh, some sort of uh, major intersection, they need to change the light. Um, they don't have to rely on those weird pulses they use anymore. Apparently, they can use this stuff as well. Um, and so it's really kind of really interesting stuff. So, I mean, there's like a bunch of stuff they're doing with this now, and then there's a bunch of stuff that they're hoping to do with it down the road. Uh, as of right now, um, they're definitely using it in New York, for instance, for electronic toll collection. There's some implementations. Uh, and then also for um, inspecting commercial vehicles, you know, like trucks, uh, on the fly. Um, so it uses a system of what's called uh, onboard units, OBUs, and then d uh, roadside units, RSUs, um, so that the, uh, any truck's equipment uh, equipped with these onboard units will be able to rep uh, um, uh, transmit to these roadside units what their manifest is, like yeah, what they're covering, um, carrying, uh, and even down to stuff like uh, you know what the condition of the truck's brakes are. Um, going f so they actually have an implementation of that up in up, uh, um, upstate New York. Um, going forward, um, once these become somewhat ubiquitous uh, in vehicles, um, it'll be used for things like collision avoidance. Like it'll tell you if somebody's in your blind spot, you're about to move over into them. Um, all the way up to things like uh, what they call platooning. So assuming that someday driverless cars become the norm. Um, so think of this, you guys would be very uncomfortable, I'm sure, driving uh, two feet off the bumper of the car in front of you, uh, unless you live in New Jersey, uh, in which case that's completely normal behavior. Um, but that aside, um, a computer might likely not be. Um, so once uh, the, uh, DSRC, which is the, the uh, technology using this, um, will be able to detect you know, the cars in front and to the sides of you, and assuming driverless cars become the norm, uh, cars will be able to drive very close together in what would be called platoons. Uh, and this will be for two purposes. Number one, um, to be able to hopefully alleviate traffic. You know, you always got the one slow guy, and then you got other guys driving fast, so everybody be driving at the same speed. And then number two, uh, for fuel economy, because the aerodynamics of the air passing over a whole fleet uh, or stream of cars uh, instead of each individually uh, would lend itself to much higher fuel economy. So these are some of the things looking going forward down the road, um, no pun intended, that they're uh, looking to do. Yeah, it's going to be really fun to hack on some of that stuff. I think there's been some work done in the past um, with it, but uh, not very much. Um, all right. So the next thing that's kind of really important with this whole, uh, you know, all all these public safety uh, networks is to find out where the hell they are. Um, and so um, reconnaissance is actually a really important phase because uh, sometimes, again, it's hard to tell which channel widths are being used. So you have to know that. Um, you know, when I was doing uh, going out and doing our war driving, I was in New York City uh, on a bicycle with an antenna hanging off my back uh, and having to drive, you know, through Times Square and hope nobody thinks I'm a bomber of some sort or anything like that. And then I would stop in front of police stations and pull out my laptop. And, you know, th that's just scary stuff. So reconnaissance is a very important thing. You don't want to be fudging with all your commands and messing around with everything beforehand. So, uh, and we'll get into this in a minute. So sometimes finding sites is a bit of pain in the butt. Um, in major metropolitan areas like New York City or Las Vegas, uh, it's fairly easy, um, given that the you know, majority of the sites um, that we found are down low using, like, omnidirectional antennas, and they're on lamp posts and things of that nature. Nature. So they're down low and fairly easy to access, uh, and they're fairly ubiquitous. Um, but in this certain instance, like New Jersey, where I am, um, the, uh, there's a large amount of licenses, um, but not a large amount of actual implementations. Uh, so you know, doing re reconnaissance, uh, proper reconnaissance, will uh, save you a lot of time and effort um, because you otherwise spend a lot of time driving around, finding absolutely nothing, and wondering if your radio works. Yeah, we were driving around New Jersey for way too long. I, I grew up there, but... Uh, you know, On the hottest day of the year. I with left, no air I left for a reason. <laughs> All right, so uh, for radio reference, if you're a ham radio enthusiast or have ever probably looked into any kind of um, you know, uh, radio, um, you probably have heard of uh, radio reference. It'll, it's a site that'll handle all of the 800 and 700 megahertz uh, bands. It's a super easy site to use. You'll see everything that's up there. Um, so that's kind of an easy, obvious one. 
Um, another thing that's really cool is this thing called CapRad. And so CapRad was used, uh, so if you wanted to deploy any of these public safety networks in your area, you, were, you had to go to a regional planning committee. And a regional planning committee would oversee the licensing of all of this good stuff and blah, blah, blah. Um, and so what they would do is they'd register in this CapRad um, uh, database and, ca and um, to see what sort of use was in that area so they wouldn't step on, on each other's toes and knew who to talk to uh, to kind of um, work together between everything. Um, so CapRad works for 700, 800, and 4.9, uh, but for 4.9 it kind of sucks. Uh, 700, 800, it looks, it works kind of good. Uh, what it'll do is it'll provide you kind of high level la areas of a uh, particular region. Um, one thing to note is it does require a username and password, um, but it's super simple to, to get one of, all you have to do is uh, register for the site and then it's a manual process, somebody has to approve you, but literally, you know, you can register dongs at uh, whitehouse.gov and they'll be okay with it. Uh, so it's not that bad to get So that. what I found CapRide to be most useful for is sort of as an aggregate of data, right? You can figure out, they have these regional planning committees, right? So all the... Um, uh, sites in a given area will fall under a given RPC, right? So you can see what RPC uh, your area falls in under what region you are. Like for instance, region eight is New York City and uh, northern New Jersey um, and maybe some of Connecticut or southern New York state. Uh, but anyway, it'll show you all that data and it'll show you a good aggregate of data for like seven and eight hundred megahertz. So it's a good first place to look. If you're searching for specific sites, it really just passes you through to the uh, FCC site search, which we'll talk about in a second. Um, but for seven and eight hundred, pretty uh, pretty useful and, and, and good as a first First step, anyway. Yeah, probably the most uh, you know useful thing for us was this FCC advanced license search. It's super easy to use. You basically just define the 4.9 gigahertz spectrum uh, range and its options. So it's 4940 to 4990, um, and then just look for active licenses and press search. Uh, it'll come back with a huge list of stuff. You can narrow it down to a specific area uh, or anything else that you want to do. There. So um, if so, if you're lucky. Depending on the on, on the records, so the records will vary somewhat, uh, wildly actually. Um, certain records, if you're lucky, you'll get the actual. So you'll be looking for the, uh, a specific transmitter site. Um, some will give you an actual physical address. Some will give you an address down to, say, for instance, certain airports. It'll tell you uh, it's on pole number two, southeast corner. Uh, so it'll be very specific. Uh, in other cases, uh, it will only give you uh, GPS coordinates. So you have to look up the GPS coordinates. Uh, in some other cases, um, they will have what they call a citywide or municipality-wide license, where it'll just say um, valid for everything within the municipality of, you know, X, Y, or Z. Uh, in which case, um, you're going to have to do a little bit more digging and it may involve some driving as well. Yeah, so especially if you're trying to figure out what areas to look at or what to target, um, sure enough, uh, there's some uh, really, really useful information, like Rob mentioned, things like GPS coordinates, exactly where you need to go. Uh, if you do more specific searches, you'll see some really oddly named things, uh, which may be appealing to an attacker. Um, and so, uh, all types of good stuff. It also tell you if it's a temporary or, or, or mobile uh, network, so you can kind of get an idea of what it's being used for and all that good stuff. So, uh, before we continue on here, um, so I guess somebody, no, nobody ever told some of the people that submit for licenses here that you don't have to tell them exactly what it's for. Yeah, was uh, because that's going to go into the record. So if you look through there, there is some uh, different erroneous and additional information that might be very uh, interesting, and that's not the only one. Um, but also, the, um, so the channel uh, center, so that'll tell you um, it, under frequencies what the channel centers are of the different transmitter sites, um, which can be, is very useful, um, because in order to be able to sniff traffic, you have to know the channel centers. And as I said earlier, uh, they vary kind of wildly between different vendors. Um, so that can be very useful to you. Um, also, it, it seems, and this is not always the case, but it is you know, uh, more the rule than not, um, that the more information in a given record uh, pertaining to um, you know, if they have physical addresses listed, if they have uh, specific frequencies listed rather than just say 4940 to 4990, uh, is the more likelihood that they actually have an implementation rather just than having a license and no implementation. Yeah, so like you can see here, these are the specific frequencies that this, uh, per, you know, particular uh, location is using. Um, so if you're trying to figure out the channels, that can be super helpful. 
It's, it's not always the case, though, because I can think of site exactly one major metropolitan area that said site-wide license, 4940 to 4990, and they have the most implementations I've seen so far. Yeah, a, a, as mentioned, I mean, some of these things are just complete falsehood, right? At, at some point, somebody was like, oh, I want 4.9 gigahertz in my, my uh, town because, you know, the governor, Bob, next door or whatever, did the same thing. So uh, they ended up just buying licenses for no, or getting licenses for no reason. It was such a waste of time for us. I hate you guys. <laughs> <laughs> um, at any rate, uh, the, the other thing, obviously, with all of anything that's on the internet, you can just use Google for it. Um, so, the, so when these regional planning committees need to apply for a license, what they basically do is write this nice, detailed letter out um, to the FCC and say, "Hey, you know, we want to use 4.9 gigahertz. We're going to use it for this reason. Um, sometimes they'll even say what these channel widths are for. Um, you know, the al channel allocations. It'll even give you some of the hardware that it's used um, and all types of good information. Uh, so here we just did a really simple search on 4.9 gigahertz NYPD and sure enough we came up with all these letters uh, right off the bat that gave us some pretty useful information when looking around. So uh, as Brad was saying, you know, if you uh, are uh, planning to implement 4.9 gigahertz within your, you know, your area or your municipality, uh, you'll fall within a regional planning committee region. So you have to submit a letter to them in order to let them know that you are planning to use this uh, at a given site. And uh, generally, you know, I don't really have to be, I don't know if they were overtly specific in this or didn't know that these would end up being public. Um, because if you could search, there's certain text that you can probably figure out from there that's uh, unique uh, for the it's the same between each letter. So if you, you, you Google that, you'll find all these different letters um, sp uh, specifying their intent. And they're usually on the local um, homeland security websites of the local area, state, and region. Um, so at any, ra any rate, they uh, generally contain a lot of information pertaining to channel frequencies, um, channel widths, um, the areas that, and locations of where the transmitters will be and the number of, um, down to the type of equipment, Cisco 3300s, et cetera, Proxim, whatever. Um, that they're going to be using. So they're, again, being overtly specific, uh, and maybe they weren't sure, that, uh, weren't, you know, uh, knowing that it's going to be made public. Uh, so I guess the first thing that we wanted to do before, um, you know, uh, we, when we were messing with all this stuff and trying to get into it, we wanted to build kind of a little test lab, uh, obviously in a Faraday cage in a foreign country um, where transmitting on this stuff is entirely legal. Uh, so we did what any normal person would do is and go on eBay uh, and see what kind of 4.9 gigahertz stuff is up on eBay. Uh, and surprisingly enough, we found a whole crap load. Um, there was a lot. Uh, so we saw these three particular ones and we ended up buying them all just because they were uh, semi-affordable um, and, uh, you know, hopefully I, maybe I can expense this, I don't know. Um, so uh, we bought all of these things, but then we surely realized uh, that, in fact, a lot of people on the internet don't know what the hell they're selling um, because we would get them and then we'd look at them and they didn't have 4.9 gigahertz radios. Then we'd have to contact them to uh, return them and, like, the guy in the bottom refused to take it back, so I had to start screaming at him, say bad things about his mom. It was like a whole situation. Um, but uh, at the end of the day, we did find something nice on eBay, which was the this Proxum Quick Bridge, and this this thing was only a hundred bucks, and all of the other ones were a thousand. Um, so that was a pretty good deal for us. Going back to my earlier comment about uh, the uh, vendors banging the government for tons of money because you know, they figure the government's got uh, deep pockets. So yeah, generally, eBay is your friend for this. You'll generally be able to find something somewhat reasonably, hopefully. Yeah, but make sure you're careful and contact the vendor to make sure they actually know what they're selling first. Um, so when I was looking at this one, it definitely looked like a good deal. And then I came across this picture on the internet. And this is a picture of um, a surveillance system that the NYPD uh, has deployed everywhere. And if you take a close look, uh, it looks like something that's extremely similar from a physical standpoint um, as the actual initial listing. Uh, so that really uh, made me super excited. I, I picked that one up right away um, and kind of continued our search for other access points we can play with. So uh, as you start doing this, if you do start doing it, um, you'll eventually find yourself noticing all sorts of APs and antennas on light posts that you never noticed before. And after a while, you'll be going, oh my god, that's Motorola. Hey, that's Proxim. You know, that's this, that's Alvarian. You know, and, uh, and you start scaring yourself. And basically all your friends hate you because you don't have conversations anymore. You just point out things that are in the air that they don't care about at all. Um, so another th interesting thing that we found when we were looking for other 4.9 gigahertz uh, uh, stuff was this forum post. Um, this is about the Ubiquity um, Nanostation M5. 
And so uh, this is just a, a standard access point that Ubiquity sells. But when we search for 4.9 gigahertz, this came up. And uh, you know the specification sheet doesn't say um, uh, the newer specification sheet uh, doesn't say that this supports 4.9. Um, but apparently, if you put this in a compliance test mode, uh, it transmits on 4.9 gigahertz. Uh, so that was really interesting to us. Uh, so we wanted to buy one of those uh, pretty quickly. Um, so we did buy one, but what ended up happening is there was no the, no compliance test mode. So we started going back through old firmwares. Maybe this that it was there. We couldn't figure it out. Um, and then Rob did some searching online and found out that in May of 2011, um, uh, basically uh, Ubiquity split the NSM5 into two different models: one a U.S. version and another one a world version. And so we had the U.S. version. We had to return it and buy the world version. And sure enough, that compliance test mode was there. So yeah, I did a little like digging into it. I was actually looking on the FCC site where they list all the complaints. And um, so the um, as we'll see in a minute when we start getting into the driver modifications, um, Ubiquity equipment only uses um, Atheros chipsets, which can be opened up all the way from like four to six gigahertz. Um, and uh, some of their equipment, including their APs, have these sort of chipsets. Hence, why those um, like the NSM5 and the, the Bullet M5 can use can uh, can do 4.9 gigahertz. Um, so, anyways, looking around the FCC side at complaints, because uh, you know that's what I do for fun, and um, I noticed that like previous to May 2011, and not that far before it, there was a complaint, uh, 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 an investigation in, uh, against the wireless ISP in Miami, and then against one also in Utah. In both cases, um, they were running. Ubiquity equipment like bullet M5s and whatnot um, outside of um, the uh, without without dynamic uh, frequency selection enabled. So basically, what they're doing is they're interfering with the Doppler radar at the local airports. Um, the FAA got pretty pissed off. Um, the FCC was then brought in, and the FCC came in and basically bent these guys over. Um, so, anyway, um, I kind of get the feeling, uh, as we'll see in a minute, that Ubiquity caught a little bit of heat about this, and it probably brought that up, brought this on. Yeah, the really interesting thing is if you try to buy one of these world versions, depending on the reseller that you contact, um, they may actually ask you to sign uh, this thing here. Um, and now keep in mind the NSM5 is not supposed to be transmitting on 4.9 gigahertz. It just so happens that the chipset in the um, access point supports that if you mess with it a little bit. Um, so what was kind of interesting is if you want to buy one of these APs that doesn't support transmitting on a license band, you have to sign this thing saying you have an FCC license. Uh, so uh, just be careful. Make sure you go out and buy, get a license uh, before you buy any of these things. We didn't sign that. No. Um, all right. So next thing is adapters. So what kind of adapters can you play around with in this uh, 4.9 gigahertz spectrum? Um, the first one that seemed extremely uh, interesting to us was the Ubiquity SR4C. Uh, this thing says public safety on it. It was kind of marketed for public safety networks, and especially the 4.9 gigahertz spectrum. Um, the thing with this is it uses the AT5K drivers, and the AT5K drivers don't actually um, support uh, 4.9 right out of the box. You have to do some changes to it. Um, so uh, while that was kind of cool and Rob some spent some money on it. Uh, I wasn't so easily convinced. Uh, then we started looking at uh, a, an adapter that we all use pretty regularly um, for 802.11 hacking called the Ubiquity SRC300. Uh, and so the specification sheet in this one just says it supports 2.4 gigahertz and 5 gigahertz. Um, but after doing some searching, we discovered that this guy, um, Kugitsuman, actually uh, create, uh, discovered that the chipset on the Ubiquity SRC uh, 300 supports anywhere from um, 4.9 to 6100 um, uh, gigahertz, right? So quite a whole bunch of, um, uh, of frequency that it can support without, that's outside of the actual spectrum. Uh, so he created this debug reg domain patch um, with, which uh, enabled all of this access. Uh, the problem was that he created it um, for Mad Wi-Fi a, a long time ago, um, and so uh, it didn't really work with all of the latest stuff. And some people have done some additional work. Oh, let me move this out of the way here. Some people have done some additional work. Um, oh no, I just messed everything up. Row, here we go. <laughs> um, yeah, so he released a patch, and then there was some uh, modifications that uh, you know um, 
uh, some, uh, refinements made. Um, Zero Chaos released a couple of patches um, a little while ago, and then um, yes, but actually Zero Chaos did a, a, a whole bunch of work on this um, and uh, released the patch that did it. But the thing that was hard for us is it didn't support the different channel widths, and that was really important to us, especially 4.9. Um, and then Spench, which is the greatest guy ever. Um, if you ever meet this guy, buy him lots of beer. He does everything awesome. Uh, what he did was he created this super uh, k kind of, um, I, I use awesome too many times, but it, it was awesome. Uh, uh, basically this, this patch um, that uh, allowed for all this kind of radar work. And it supported 4.9 gigahertz and supported a different channel bandwidth. But it was a kind of complex and it, was a, it didn't currently work for the drivers that were uh, the latest version, um, and it was kind of overkill to what we really needed it for. Yeah, so the problem with the um, F5K driver and Compat Wireless in general is that uh, it changes significantly over time. So uh, a patch that you've done even you know a year ago uh, may not work as changes to the kernel and the wireless stack are made. Um, so what we did was we looked at Compact Route Wireless really quick to figure out is, is uh, you know, is there any changes that we can make um, that, that would kind of help us out. Uh, so basically Compact Wireless is uh, a package of all of the, the Linux drivers and all of the 802.11 stack. Um, and so the way it works is Compact Wireless has this uh, regulatory uh, module that queries the card's EEPROM uh, from one of the places. One of the ways it figures out where you are is by querying the card's EEPROM um, for a regular domain. So if you bought a card that's meant for use in the U.S., you queries it, it gets a U.S. regulatory domain. That domain is then used to figure out what channels are allowed in your area. So uh, co uh, Compact Wireless's uh, regulatory module will either query its driver channel definitions, it has some internally, um, or look at something called uh, the central reg uh, regulatory domain agent. And what the CRDA does is it's a user land agent um, that ties to uh, a, a local database um, that looks up all the different channel frequencies and all that kind of good stuff. Um, you're supposed to be able to kind of override, uh, uh, you know, your EEPROM's uh, uh, regulatory domain uh, with the IW reg set command, but that never Doesn't seems work. to work yeah, anywhere. Uh, so it was a, kind of an issue for us. So we wanted to figure out, um, you know, an easier way to make everything work, but still use CRDA so we had some flexibility uh, and, and make things uh, right. Yeah, so there was like a couple patches that were released a few years ago that actually specifically addressed that functionality to allow you to set a reg domain. It allowed it to uh, actually uh, respect uh, using IW reg set because as I take it it seems to be like purposely broken so that you're not able to uh, fudge around with things that, and be naughty you know uh, so uh, what we ended up doing was we looked into the drivers really quick, um, and it's surprising how much of this function, a lot of the functionality is there, just not really used uh, in the drivers. Um, so uh, looking through, basically the way that it works is there's this uh, ath is four nine gigahertz allowed function um, that uh, that is queried to define, uh, and depending on the regulatory domain, it will either define um, the the lower boundary of the of the channels to be uh, four nine two zero, um, and if that regulatory domain is not allowed. Instead, it will be uh, fi somewhere 5,005. Uh, so, um, you know, that was a, a, a bit of a, a thing. So all we did was kind of just return true for that function. Um, and then, you know, we have uh, always 4.9 uh, access all the time on, you know, any, uh, anything. Um, the other thing that we had to do again was some support those different channel widths. Um, so it was surprising on in the actual code comments of the drivers exactly uh, how much stuff was detailed there. So by default, everything is pretty much hard coded for 20 megahertz channels. You can't really do too much past that. Um, but it's like you know the person who was writing the code just got lazy halfway through and was like, you know what, I'm not going to write this code. I'm just going to write comments on how you to do it. Um, which you know is probably the comments are probably more code than was required to actually make it all work. Um, so we had to do a little bit more work, but nonetheless everything uh, ended up working out pretty yeah. fine. So what was cool is at least that the, the uh, 4.9 stuff was uh, a lot of it was in there uh, at least with 20 megahertz wide channels because uh, in Japan uh, they use what's called uh, there's an amendment for it called uh, 802.11j uh, because in Japan they actually have a, a 4.9 gigahertz um, spectrum that they can use. Uh, it's not uh, public safety, uh, but the uh, the uh, support was already in there somewhat for it. Uh, it just wasn't activated. 
Yeah, so basically what we did was we made this, uh, the different channel widths defined um, via a, a module option or a module parameter. Uh, we actually use the same name as the module parameter for Sp uh, that Spence uh, used. Um, it's different code underneath, but it's still the same, same name just to kind of maintain some consistency there. Um, and you can just easily define what bandwidth you want to use, whether it be 20, 5, 10, or uh, 40 megahertz Y channels. Uh, and then you can use that there. Um, so to make all this work, there's a script. Uh, the the um, uh, the URL is down on the bottom. GitHub.com/openSecurityResearch, and you basically run the script. It'll automatically download, compile everything. You don't have to do any work. You just dot slash, and, it, and it'll work fine. Um, if you wanted to manually do stuff after you compile the the new Compact Wireless with the drivers uh, and with the patch, um, we have all of kind of the options there. Uh, just create a monitor remote interface, and then you can kind of use TCB dump or Kismet or whatever you want to use to to kind of sniff on that th that spectrum. Um, a couple of other things that we did was um, that actual regulatory database. Uh, we had to add some specific um, additions to that so it can support the 4.9 and ultimately the 5.9 gigahertz stuff too. Um, so we're going to use CRDA rather than making statically uh, defined channels, so uh, it's statically defined ranges, uh, so anybody can kind of play with it and not have to recompile the drivers every time. Um, and then finally, there's some uh, basic options you need to configure with Kismet. Uh, so we also provide just a, a basic Kismet configuration file um, so that you can channel hop on these channels and not have too much problems associated with it. Yeah, so in Kismet, you can do it a couple different ways. You can either set a, a frequency range and then define within that your, uh, the number of channels and the channel widths, uh, or you can just define uh, you know, specific channels. Uh, so it pretty much depends on how you want to do it. Generally, you would probably define a range and channels in that, and then uh, the set it to hop so you can hop throughout the uh, various um, uh, channels in the in the 4.9 band. Um, then once you kind of figure out where you are, lock on to a specific channel and uh, and and find the, uh, the and, and monitor the traffic there. Um, all right. So the very first thing we did uh, was we checked out uh, New Jersey. Um, wow, we have. 10 minutes left and quite a lot of slides, so we're going to try to tear through these. Um, but yeah, the first thing we did was take a look at New Jersey. Um, we did a lot of driving around, uh, but didn't find too much. Uh, they actually have this whole YMAX implementation there, uh, and our drivers weren't, um, you know, our adapters couldn't really support any of that stuff. Uh, so we did do a lot of driving on the per turnpike and the, and, uh, and the parkway, a lot of fist bumping, drank a lot of Red Bull, it was great. Um, but we didn't find too much. Uh, the next thing we looked at was again that 4.9 gigahertz mesh network at, in NYPD. Um, so on the bottom here is the channel list that you can use to find uh, that network if you are in uh, New York. Um, and so basically, what you'll notice is is uh, they have those uh, again those APs on the top, and all of these things are kind of in line of sight of each other. So if you go through a big pedestrian area, um, an area like Times Square, uh, you'll see these things all over the place, and their antennas are all aligned because they're all point-to-point -point networks across everything. Um, and uh, you can actually see some of the data that's being transmitted. Um, the kind of interesting thing that we noticed was that there were default SSIDs and kind of really obscure SSIDs. Um, so the obscure ones seemed to be obvious that those were the network that uh, NYPD was using, uh, but the default ones seemed like maybe those uh, APs were just not configured, um, which has some kind of interesting implica Im implications if you think about it. You know, if it's a default access point there, that's it's kind of concerning. Um, another thing that we noticed is with these networks, all we saw was probe, re uh, probe requests. Um, so that was kind of odd because usually you would see constant beacons out all the time. You wouldn't necessarily see probe requests. Um, so uh, you know, I, I don't know what would happen uh, if you responded to those probe requests or if you could do anything like that. Um, obviously, we weren't going to transmit on anything, um, but it might be something interesting to look into. Um, another another kind of uh, uh, network that we saw was when you get closer to the stations, the actual police stations, uh, you'll see an antenna out front, and those were uh, transmitting some stuff too. And so I was again riding around on my bicycle and waiting in front of the um, police station, seeing what I can find, uh, and uh, took a look and was able to get an e-handshake. And if you look kind of closely, uh, there's something maybe a little alarming to anybody who knows anything about wireless. There's um, some leap that's being used. And if you watched a talk by uh, Moxie and David Holton today, uh, you might know that leap uses uh, MSChat v2 uh, handshake that goes across. Um, so that could be kind of concerning since they crack that in you know under 24 hours. So um, looking at the equipment that's being used in 4.9, it really seems as though like not uh, in, you know not. 
any additional uh, security measures have been taking place. You still see leap in use. You uh, still see uh, weapon use. So it seems like uh, you know we're not learning from any of our mistakes, or that the implementations have been there for a while. Um, and then also, you know, we did see a lot of Cisco OUIs available to things and things that indicated that Cisco was being used a lot. Um, but those Proxim APs looked almost identical to the ones that we bought. Um, so Proxim has this proprietary protocol called the WARP, the Wireless Outdoor Routing Protocol. Um, and so there were some uh, some older hacks with uh, with WARP, uh, but when we tried them, no nothing seemed to work. Uh, even with our AP, we tried to put it in DFU mode and we couldn't get anything out of it. Um, so it's kind of a proprietary protocol. And you might not have too much access to it. Uh, the next thing that we looked at was uh, Vegas. So we weren't even going to look at Vegas, but then we, when we came here, um, we were drunk, and you know things come up. Well, uh, so. We decided to, uh, so on the bottom there is the, again the channel list that you can use to, to, to view what kind of data is there and, uh, and view it. So uh, real quick, we were actually, more or less what happened is I was sitting up in my room and I was just um, looking at uh, actually the 2.4 gigahertz spectrum. And uh, what you'll see a lot with, um, uh, uh, quite often um, with uh, the uh, 4.9 gigahertz equipment, the equipment that's being implemented in these mesh networks is that um, they're dual band. It'll be on 2.4 gigahertz and 4.9 gigahertz. Uh, and in this case, uh, I was beaconing a default uh, SSID um, for that particular type of equipment um, which uh, on 2.4 gigahertz, which led me to go, hey, Brad, let's go take out the 4.9 antennas and see what we find. Sure enough, it was transmitting on both bands um, and using the same default SSID in both cases. Yeah, so we did see some um, we did see some beacons here. So definitely a different technology that's being used. Um, and what was kind of interesting is we saw this weird frame here, uh, and we weren't really sure what it is, and we still kind of aren't. Uh, we think it's some sort of uh, kind of announcement frame, since the areas that are marked out are actually the MAC addresses um, of the um, of the the sender. Um, so they're probably some sort of beacon. They were sent on pretty regular basis. So this this all of this network seems to be. I mean, basically guessing. We were guessing that this is all. Um, part of the wireless surveillance network that you see out there. Um, but uh, one thing that's kind of interesting is, is these particular Motorola mesh networks actually have four antennas. Um, one, they have two 2.4 and uh, two 4.9 gigahertz. And um, two of those four antennas actually use a proprietary protocol called um, a mobility enhanced access um, so that you can't have too much access to it. Uh, one interesting thing is on the 2.4 gigahertz spectrum we saw a lot of plain text ARP, uh, unencrypted ARP traffic going out for publicly routable IP addresses. Um, so that could be something, I don't know if anybody saw, saw Colin Mueller's talk at uh, Black Hat, but basically what he did was scan a bunch of uh, public internet I IP addresses that turned back into, um, you know, uh, devices kind of like the ones that we're seeing transmitted. So the uh, mobility MEA, uh, or Motorola MEA, uh, is something I should, would like to take a look into in the future. It's a proprietary protocol um, for mesh networks. Uh, and where it really shines, I suppose, is in um, uh, in-vehicle modems. So mo modems, for instance, are what radio is mounted in like a police car for instance um, because it can do uh, a, a sort of GPS without using satellites where it can uh, time the pings or the packets that have come back through multiple radios or multiple uh, access points from that given radio and be able to detail you know pinpoint uh, where a given mobile radio is um, so for mesh networks it really signs um, sadly it's not 802.11 compatible so you're not able to look at it with a uh, traditional 802.11 card um, but they do have uh, cards available for it. Um, so it's something I kind of want to take a peek at in the future. Uh, and then, uh, luckily enough, Rob, at, you know, out of all the hotel rooms in Vegas, um, for whatever reason, Rob tend to be in one that picked up this other network that we, we haven't seen anywhere else. Um, it looks to be a SkyPilot network. And so if you know anything about mesh networks, um, SkyPilot can provide backhaul networks for mesh networks that are a little lower. Uh, it'll handle uh, all of that kind of good stuff. Um, so we did find all of this ridiculous traffic all over the place uh, that we weren't able to figure out what it was. And so um, that's just kind of letting you know what, what's out there. If you know anything about mesh networks, we'd love to talk to you so we can play around with these uh, different captures. So really quickly, the war driving summary, you make sure you have to get your channels right. Um, there, uh, uh, some um, networks are not 4.9, uh, are not uh, on 4.9, are not 8.11 compatible, so that could be a problem. And there's lots of proprietary protocols out there. 
Uh, one last thing that we noticed when we were doing research was um, that we were wondering if 4.9 gigahertz could be hacked or being targeted or any, any chance. So let me take this. So I, I don't know if you guys knew about this, uh, this hack. It was in the news like a couple months ago uh, about this uh, town, uh, Lamont, Illinois, um, that their, uh, one night their tornado sirens, um, I, uh, not a thing I'm familiar with on the East Coast, but apparently it's quite common in the central U.S., all their tornado sirens went off. And they, well, it was like for an hour and they, they couldn't figure out why. And I, I remember reading the interview with the police chief, and he said, yeah, for 20 minutes it was the tornado warning sign, sound, and then for the next 20 minutes it was the sound for a military attack, which I'd never heard before. And I was like, well, gee, I hope not. Uh, it's like Red Dawn, right? Um, so anyway, I noticed in one of the articles that they mentioned that the... Um, the, the event, they brought their vendor in, they, they suspected uh, uh, it was, you know, someone hacked, uh, hacked it over wireless, and they brought the vendor in, and the vendor uh, to fix it, which was um, a federal signal. Um, so no offense against them, but that's just, you know, it was, it was mentioned in the article. So I'm like, hmm. So one of the things I, I, I've been doing in order to find wire, um, 4.9 gigahertz networks was looking for press releases um, from vendors, because whenever vendors do an uh, implementation for a municipality, they usually will put out press releases and crow about it and whatnot. And um, sure enough, I saw a press release from a few years uh, previous that Federal Signal did a 4.9 gigahertz network implementation for this town. It's like, okay. Then I looked up and I saw that Federal Signal also seems to be a prodigious manufacturer of uh, tornado sirens that can be um, hmm. uh, used or, or communicated to or triggered, rather, um, over 4.9 gigahertz. So my interest is, uh, is peaked. Um, so looking at the two there, it seemed like it might be quite likely that somebody actually did uh, hacksor them over 4.9. Uh, then doing a little more searching, I found this. <laughs> so... What's, what's going on here, guys? I, what's going on? So no one could have foreseen this coming, for sure. No idea. Um, <clears throat> well, so... And, and notice he said from your home computer, because that's definitely where you want to hack something from. <laughs> all right, guys. Well, thanks for your time. If you have any questions, feel free to email us, uh, email us up here, and you can get all the code up there. Thanks. Thank you.